Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I'm your host, Chris Broussard. We've got another terrific show for you today. We've got a very insightful interview with the Milwaukee Bucks general manager, John Horst. We've got another dynamic segment of Knockdown Jay with Jason McIntyre. And as always, we started off with the top five. LeBron James is having a phenomenal season. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. And a lot of people are even talking like, this is the best LeBron James we've ever seen. In fact, LeBron himself has said he's playing at an all-time high. And that got me to thinking, what are the five best regular seasons, not including postseason, not playoffs, not championships, regular seasons of LeBron James's career? Now, look, I'm not basing it on just stats because LeBron is basically 27 points, seven rebounds, seven assists a game, give or take a few, every single season. This was like choosing Michael Jackson's best song. I mean, it, it's almost impossible to do. At number five, this season, that's right, 2017, 2018. Look, LeBron is playing great. Don't get me wrong. It's phenomenal what he's doing, especially in his 15th year. But while it's unusual for a player to play so well in his 15th year or, or close to his career best, it's not completely unprecedented. Carl Malone, he was 36 in his 15th year, and he averaged 25 points, nine rebounds, 50% shooting from the floor. Kobe Bryant averaged 25 points in his 15th year as well, and then the next two years gave you 27 a game. At number four, 2009-2010, it was LeBron's seventh year in the league, and his last in Cleveland in that first go round. He was tremendous, led the Cavs to 61 wins. First time in his career that he shot 50% from the floor, was a hair below 30 points a game, got to the free throw line 10 times a night, and averaged what was at that time a career high 8.6 assists. At number three, 2011-2012, that was the lockout shortened season, LeBron's second in Miami, and he was on an absolute mission after faltering the year before against Dallas in the NBA Finals. Where you really saw it was on the defensive end, LeBron was at his best on that end of the floor. Better than ever, set a career best for defensive rating and anchored that swarming Miami Heat defense that took the entire league by storm. At number two, 2008-2009. That was the first year LeBron James won the MVP award. He had a PER of 31.7, his career best, fourth best all time. Only Wilt Chamberlain and Michael Jordan have ever had a higher PER for the season. LeBron was so good good. He led a starting five that included Mo Williams, Zydrunas Ilgauskas, and old Ben Wallace and Delonte West to a league best 66 wins. And at number one, 2012-2013, LeBron's third season in Miami. Now this year he was playing with the confidence and the swagger of an NBA champion. It was right after his first ring and he was just completely dominant. Went to another level on the offensive end even because he shot 56% from the floor, including a career best 40% from three. He was just like a man amongst boys. He led the Miami Heat to a franchise record, 66 wins, including 27 straight. So there you have it. Those are the five best seasons of LeBron James's career, according to yours truly. He's still going incredibly strong, but it would take Superman to top his best ever. <laughs> All right, here we go with another episode of Knockdown J, one of my favorite parts of the podcast. What's up, man? How Good you to doing? be back after victories last week. You keep Look at saying a that. Eight again it was three zero last week, two one the week before. I'm going Yet back you to back a victory. on you. Just hanging around, just getting like <laughs> one or two percent of the YouTube comments pro J Mac. Rocky, Jay Mac, from Rocky that's a one where I'm like, you? keep getting knocked out, but you can't knock me out. No. You keep getting knocked down. You just, if you had stopped there, you would have been good. All right, let's dive into the topics, All right. Chris. So, uh, obviously, last week, the big story in the league was the Kawhi Leonard beef with the San Antonio Spurs. It's lingering. We know about the players meeting. Chris, I got to ask you, it's gotten ugly. We know he's up for the Supermax extension this offseason. I believe Kawhi Leonard should demand a trade from the San Antonio Spurs in the same way that Kyrie Irving said he wanted out of Cleveland 
in the same way Paul George said, I'm not sticking around here. We know it's the super team era. Kawhi Leonard, I, I would ask Kawhi, hey, how long is Greg Popovich going to be around? You know he's the longest tenured coach in the league by 12 years. He's been around since 1996. He's 69 years old. How much longer is Pop going to stick around? And if I'm Kawhi, look at the roster. It's aging. Pau Gasol's 37, going to be 37. Manu, is he coming back? Tony Parker looks washed. He's had a great career. LaMarcus Aldridge is great as the man, but he's going to be 32, 33. If I'm Kawhi Leonard, I demand a trade out of San Diego. Wow. Demand a trade? No way. No way he should demand a trade. In fact, you mentioned, first things first, you mentioned five years, $219 million Supermax. Guess who t can give that to him? San Antonio. And no one else. Nobody else. Yeah. So you that's number one. On if you like money, yeah. then that's enough reason you stay in San Francisco. So there's San what, Antonio. There's 219 versus 100, what, 70, 180? Yeah, about. Okay. So you're right. I mean, it's a ton of money anyway. But still, if you want top dollar, you can only get it in San Antonio. That's the first thing. But it's not like you're in some basketball outpost that where you're never going to win. You have a coach who is arguably the greatest coach in NBA history, a coach who has won five championships. And I could argue against you that the last four of those championships, he never had the most talent in the league. Because his second champ, his first championship with D David Robinson and Tim Duncan, yeah, obviously the, they, the Twin Towers, they, they may have had the best in the league. After that, he won during the Kobe Shaq era. Yes, I'd have to give the Lakers the edge in talent. He obviously beat Miami, you know, with LeBron and Wade and Bosh and, and the big three and all that. Okay. So I could argue he, he has won these championships when his team was not the most talented. Right. Certainly that last team to win it, Duncan, was old. They were old. So – and you're talking about the super team era. For LaMarcus Aldridge, remember a few years ago when he was on the market, everybody wanted him. A few, he was, was a, a few years ago. He though, was Chris. the most, he's 32. He, did, he went to the Spurs last summer and said, I want out of here, I want to trade. Yeah, and but they, they, they work okay. things out. But I'm just saying, like, they work things LaMarcus out. Now he's happy. knew their history, and he still went in and demanded a trade. Well, just after so he know. had been there and things weren't yeah. working out. And he didn't demand it because he, he reneged on it and say, and, and they worked things out and everything's fine now everything's with fine. him. Now, yeah. so my point is you already have a second star. So you got – you, you and, and then Pop can build around – I mean, Pop – Can he? Pop, yes. Okay, then the best free agent outside of LaMarcus that the San Antonio Spurs have My gotten. point is this. This is the point I'm making. Popovich takes guys that are manure – Elsewhere, oh, I'm, Danny Green could not get off the bench in, in Cleveland. Cleveland. Yes, yes. He goes to San Antonio, I call and him he manure. is a okay. That's a little that's hard. a little strong because Danny Danny is a good. But I'm, really good in player. Cleveland, we didn't know what he could do because he never played. But Danny is a key cog in San Antonio Excellent. and has been on a championship team. Patty Mills, Patty Mills wasn't even in the league. He's a nice role pa player in San Antonio. Right. That's my point. Greg, Kyle Anderson is, is playing well for them now. I'm just saying these are guys that elsewhere, Kyle wasn't elsewhere, but still guys that elsewhere wouldn't be that good. Matt Bonner, you know, we can go down the yeah, list. Again, but that Beer was, trends. A lot these, of that was so my point is you've already Duncan. got the two. No, it's not thanks to Tim well, Duncan. Well, Patty Mills Tim Duncan was in his later But Patty years. is playing well without Who's Duncan. well. So is Danny He's Green. Not, I mean, come on. Is Patty so, Mills a factor in a series against the Warriors or Rockets? Yes. No. He was a factor against no, the no, Heat. No, right now I'm saying right he now. He could be. Five years ago. Come well, on. Greg Chris. Popovich, you got two building blocks, yeah. Kawhi and, and LaMarcus. A 32-year-old power forward is a building block in this league? Who's going to be the most coveted free agent this summer? Oh, my God. Don't tell me. Hold on. Be... Who's going to be the most coveted free agent well, this LeBron, summer? Well, LeBron, obviously. How old is he? LeBron's, come on, you're comparing LaMarcus to I'm LeBron. I'm just saying, Stop. don't no, give no, me the no. numbers. Stop going down Guys that are playing that silly, longer Chris. than that. LaMarcus Aldridge is averaging 23 oh points God. and eight and now, a half with rebounds. nobody else on the team exactly. in their Nobody else on the team and, and he's won anywhere. 44 he games to, to last round. week. Right, let, let me nobody back. else on the team and he's got a 50. Chris, let, no, 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 oh since you want to rap. Yeah. Since you want to get into I mean, it. This is crazy. No, what you're saying about LaMarcus Let's say they're the fifth seed. We know it could change. Yeah. The four seeds ahead of LaMarcus Aldridge and, and his junk squad, as you I didn't call say it was junk. I said they're not Nobody going else. anywhere. They're okay. like 47 Number one, teams. Houston got two superstars. Number two, Golden State has four probable Hall of Famers. Number three, Portland 
has two really, really good. stars. We could say even stars. McCollum is pretty much a star. Number four, if it's OKC, you got three stars. LaMarcus Aldridge is hanging with those teams and he's by himself. Well, I think that's more Popovich, but if you okay. want to Okay, okay. Popovich is going to be. That's why I'm saying, I'm saying if you're Kawhi Leonard, do not no, leave no, no, Greg okay. Popovich. Let me counter that quickly. But, Come on, man. All right, listen. When you are Kawhi Leonard watching this team, man, they got old. Next year, they're going to be a year older. And guess what? I look at the standings. Well, the Warriors lapped us. We know that. Shucks, the Houston Rockets have come up. They got Chris Paul. They're better than us. Portland. They're better wow. than you because you are you're out. Well, yeah, and when if you play, next, they won't be better than you. You could be just as good. An older team. They're always oh, old. It's gonna be when, shit. They're gonna when be hasn't San Antonio year. been old? They've been old for a the while. The mid two thousands. Super old now, and your coach is sixty nine. How much longer is he sticking around? Look, that's if a I'm legit Kawhi question. Leonard, I, I would want to know. Total ball I would, of wax. I demand say, a the trade. West is better. Get me up out of here. Hold on. Okay. I see it's a super team era. I want a super team, and you can't Let me ask you. Him and LaMarcus Aldridge and a cast of role players that yeah. Popovich can get the most right, out of right. is a super team. Yeah. Were they How'd a they super do? team last year? How'd they do in the West against the Warriors? Oh, that's right. They got swept. That's let's really your the, argument. No, part. no, no. You don't <laughs> determine where we go. That's your argument. No, that was, that Kawhi was Leonard saying, got that hurt. Was you you that all, was every time we debate something, you throw out a just crazy that was statement. That's funny. People are laughing. They oh, aren't okay. laughing. They're looking right, at you, we'll scratching laugh. their head, and quitting together memes. Okay. So here, Stupid uh, memes. Ahead, That's what they're ahead. putting together. Figure out your final wrap up topic. Look, look, you have, if you're Kawhi Leonard, last year, Every year you've been there, you've been one of the best teams in the league. You've been a top three or four team in the league. Mm -hmm. Has it been because you've had a super team? No. It's because you had yourself, you had a second star, LaMarcus Aldridge, and you had a tremendous yeah. coach who maximizes his role players. And if you want to distinguish yourself from all these other guys that have to have two superstars with them to win, you win with one. You, know what? you win and people say, he did it without yeah. a super team. Kawhi Leonard and you can do that in San right Antonio. Now, if Kawhi Leonard walked in the store and I said, hey, Kawhi, how are things going with the, uh, the staff there, with the Spurs? How, how do you like the health and conditioning group? What do you think his answer would be? He's never played more than 75 games in a season, and he doesn't want to return to this team right now. That's pretty evident. When the team brings him in and say, Kawhi, we're playing three on three. You look great. What's up? And Kawhi's like, ah, I'm not That's ready. a different That's topic. That's a problem with the That's a different front. topic. No, 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 no. That if is. I'm coming back, I need Why? to know you, the that question. they have my back. And if they do have his well, back. clearly he disagrees with you, Chris. How do they not have his because back? Because he's not playing. He's, they're saying, Kawhi, that's, you're healthy. That's because he, he's he saying, doesn't believe he's healthy. His doctors but, are telling him he's not. But the team is saying you are. Where are you? There's a disconnect there, Chris. They've got peace. I'm not saying there's There is not. a lack of trust if he's not coming back. He says, I'm not ready. They're saying, you're ready. Get back here. Popovich calling him out. Manu calling him out. Chris, there is some beef there. I don't there. think Manu called him out. I think Manu just stated a fact. He's not we coming can't back. rely uh, on Kawhi Leonard that, coming back. The meeting was described as tense. You're coming no, back to that? But my, why you're not? Back. They want you back. There's some beef. Look, man, you know how many teams have had tense meetings? Yeah. Probably a few. Do you don't think LeBron and Kevin Love have had tense Again, moments? we're talking LeBron. Now they're LeBron buddy, buddy. The entire organization. We're talking two That's players. That's your guy, LeBron. That's what we're talking Never about. Two players. Be like, Chris, don't mention LeBron in the same sentence. All right, as Kawhi. go ahead. Yeah, Since you, Neil, you're getting go, silly let's go now. To the go ahead. Card. It's close, but Chris's first point with the max contract wins it. I'm sorry, McIntyre. The streak. How about the, the streak championship? goes on? If you if you like money and you like winning, why why leave? I mean, so, seriously. Are the are, hold on? You said if you like winning, are the uh, let's just put you on the spot. Are the Spurs winning a title in the next three years? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next topic. Uh, let's move on, Chris. Gosh, that's embarrassing. Did you ever think? Of, no did you shot. ever think an old Tim Duncan would beat LeBron, Wade, and Chris Bosh? Yeah, they had a chance in that series. Of course, they were the best team in the West that My day. My point is, during they're, that they're, era, they're you would have said, "No, they're not beating." LeBron I, and them. I don't know. Anyways. All it's right, a moving great on. coach and So, system. because Chris loves James Harden as the MVP, you did call that early, a rare good call by Bruce Hart. He was on James Harden as MVP early. And I left you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> um, and his backcourt mate, Chris Paul's had a good year, been injured a little bit, missed, what, 15, 20 games? In Golden State, we have the preeminent backcourt in the league, Clay and Steph. But I got to ask you, you love Harden so much. 
Who's the best backcourt in the league this year, Houston or Golden State? Look, I think Golden State with Steph and Clay, I think that's the best backcourt in NBA history. Yes, yes. Okay? And right. the reason I've said that is because these guys are playing their entire primes together. They're Chemistry. In, in a prime. It's like us. We've okay? been doing this for six months. It's yes. like we're boys now. And so the other team, other backcourts you mentioned, Isaiah Thomas and – Gail Goodrich and Jerry West, Isaiah and Dumar. Magic Scott and Byron Walt. Scott? Yeah, I mean, Byron wasn't quite on uh, all Hall of Famer like all these guys, but still he was very good. Um, you know, all those you would mention, Clyde Frazier and Earl Pearl Monroe, they were together maybe four years, five years max as in their prime. And so longevity goes to Golden State and they won championships. But right now, oh, no. this Wait year. I heard a butt. Let me, fin- let me talk. This year. I think Houston's backcourt has unquestionably been – it's close. I wouldn't say unquestionably. It's close because Golden <laughs> State is great. I don't want to take anything for those guys. But Chris Paul and James Harden, I think, are sl- slightly better than the Golden State Warriors backcourt for this one year. They're not together long enough where I could call them an all-time great backcourt long term. But for this one year – and here's the thing. And we're I mean, just looking things. at we're looking. We're not counting Eric Gordon in here, right? It's no, just, no, okay, just right. these two. Um, assist. They're they're giving you 17 assists a game. Okay, or let me just shut. 16. Let me just shut that down. Totally different system. The Warriors won a system where Draymond Green leads them in assists. Well, right? fine. so it's a different system. Whatever, but whatever. Cool. It doesn't so nullify down point statistics. Number one, just so you no, know. you didn't shut it down. No. Systems smish them. <laughs> teams play different systems. Is that a saying? I mean, sir, I like teams that. play different systems. Okay. You know, so. The last time we saw a backcourt average have two guys with this many assists was Magic Johnson and Norm Nixon Ooh. in the early 80s. Were you watching this? T- is inc- watching yes, NBA I was. Okay. This is incredibly unique mm-hmm. to have two guys, and you got two Hall of Famers who are definite Hall of Famers, not because they win championships. Now, Steph's going to be a Hall of Famer. Clay's going to be a Hall of Famer because okay, so he's going to have the let's championship. Let's toss the Hall of Fame out. You're, no, you're on a bad but I'm run. saying they're, they're, they're two Hall of Famers. Time. And then on top of that, the one thing they do that Steph and Clay don't do a lot, and this is a big thing, they get to the free throw line. Harden gets to the line 10 times a game, CP3 only four, but combined that's 14, 14. free throw attempts okay. a game. You know what that does? That gets your opponent in foul trouble. Clay and Steph, Clay only gets to the line 1.4 times a game. He barely touches so the basketball. So they're getting there dude. seven <laughs> times a game. Yeah, that's So not, I'm that's getting there game, twice though. as much. That's not as Fine. That's not, My I mean, point is that I have a backcourt that scores from the free throw line and also gets the opponent in foul trouble. That's a huge thing because that means more free throws for mm. us. So, look, I love Golden State. Mm. I'm not trying to take away from them. But I think these two Hall of Famers who get more rebounds, more assists, more free throw attempts. I won't even say points because you got Durant taking some points away Mike. from Clay and Steph, but they still produce more Boy, points. Boy, if, that, if that's your argument, you, you just lost. What's yours? See, I mean, that's terrible. What's yours? Chris, I mean, I'm... All right, let, let me start with Clay Thompson. By the way, did you know he's having the best shooting season of his career? Did, were you aware of that? Shooting 49% from the field, shooting guard, which is better than Harden and better than CP3, and he's shooting 43% from deep. Also, better than Harden, better than CP3. Okay. Clay Thompson's having a great season. He doesn't even touch the ball. Getting to the foul line, that's not his thing. He is one it, of the it's best. It's not his thing, but it's an important yeah, part of the he's game. A, he's one of the best two-way players in the league, right? With Kawhi Leonard injured. you Chris gotta Paul put, isn't. Chris Paul's up there, but I would say Clay Thompson is ahead of Chris I, Paul. Chris Paul's a great defender, as is Clay. Clay but Thompson I, I wouldn't is give, a tremendous. I'd say they're you, both we're gonna close. See, we're going to see Clay on the all-defensive team. I don't know if it's first, but he'll be on second or third. He's a Chris great Paul defender. Chris Paul is a, is a mainstay on the all-defensive team. Yes, he's team. also, what, 33, 34 years old? I, 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 right now, He's led the Clay league Thompson. Still six we're going to see it in the, in the playoffs. When they meet, Clay will check Harden. That's going to be the decisive matchup in the series. And then let's he's go to Steph get, Curry, one of the most used. underappreciated superstars in the NBA You think today. he's underappreciated? Oh, my goodness. He set by the bar. Who? By everyone. He set the bar so he's high. He's a two-time MVP. When he was the unanimous MVP, something Michael Jordan did not do, something LeBron did not do. He set the bar so high with the 50, 45, 90 stuff. The guy's shooting 42% from three. And we're like, ah, oh, it's a good season. He's averaging 26, 6, and 5. We're like, ah. Oh. I mean, he's, uh, Steph Curry is an amazing talent. And we're just kind of like, ah, uh, because they're so I dominant right now. I like, ah. Uh. 
Dude, Everybody all we're talking knows about is Steph James is Harden. Great. All we're talking about is James Harden, Damien well, Lillard, James and the MVP Harden is having the best season of anybody that, in the league. That he is That's had. That's clear. But, uh, no, again, that anybody's having this season. This season. Somebody's having a better season than no, James no, Harden? No, James Harden will win the MVP, okay. as you so, said. So, 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 so if we go down the line. So you can have all the assists you Who's want. Give me the three-point shooting. Of these Clay four, and Curry are both shooting better from deep than CP3 and Harden. We're in a three-point league, Chris. Give me the two better three-pointers. Well, what I get team? that. Uh, the Rockets make okay, the most, but so, we're just so talking backcourt. No, that no, 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 no. We're talking backcourt. Okay, they make one more per game. Better three-point shooters. One more per game facts. than Rockets. I'm just going to stick oh, to the facts. Are. There's no question okay. there. So you can have but your But they make one more throws. three pointer yes, per game. I will have my three pointers. Okay, hold on. Let's 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 clear, clear it up then. No. Who's shooting you, better from you three? You make one more three pointer per game no, than the Rockets. No, it's not just numbers. It's efficiency. These two guys, as you said, they don't get to the foul line. You make seven. 7.3 three-pointers a game in your backcourt. Houston's make 6.4. So you make so you one, one, so one three-pointer. Three and does that not make up for the three, three, three throws pointers. that they're not getting? Hold on, hold it on. It almost hold on. does. That's three, three, point, that's three points, okay? My guys go to the line 14 times a game. Yours go seven. How many do they make? Both of them are great three-throw shooters. They so let's tremendous. say they're making, they're probably out of 14, I would say they're probably those two making are 90%, 12. Yeah. So that's five points at least right so there. So you have two so points I got two, more per game. But I, my guys give on you a team more with assists. Kevin Durant. Hold on, hold on. Well, my guys give this. you more assists. My guys are giving 16 assists a game. Your guys are giving seven. Okay. So this seven, seven assists a so game. So the stats are very so close. I'm both giving sides. no. I just are I they just, not very close? No. Well, they're I, my guys to average out. far more rebounds, far more assists. Again, the far problem more is in a back, what backcourt averages rebounds? What backcourt averages the rebounds? Rockets. These guys have Draymond Green the and Rockets. Kevin Durant. They got Clint Capella Fine. getting a lot okay, of rebounds. Okay, so this boils down to the question. We'll get to Neil in a second. You would take the Rockets backcourt. If I said to you right now, Chris, the, let, going let me into do the playoffs, who do you want? backcourt do you I, I want? I said Rockets. Oh, my gosh. All now, right. listen. I, I, it's just staggering listen, to me. Listen. Greatest backcourt of all time of, or this of, year. Of like, all, we're talking about this year. Lunacy. I said, of, of, look. Your your lunacy. It's lunacy I, I, I to say people, this is lunacy. And I know they're going to come at me because in the both of you them are the good. Rockets. I don't Hold like on. the Rockets. Both of these, I'm not are disrespecting it's one the and two, right? Now let me ask you this: of uh, this year, we got Steph, Clay, Harden, Chris Paul. Who's having the best year of those four players? James Harden. Okay, MVP. I got one. Who's having the second best? Wait, are we counting Durant in who's here? A, no, of you, these four players, who's having the second best? Steph Curry. Who's having the third best? Clay Thompson. Over Chris Paul. Clay, Clay Thompson's played more games. Chris Paul's missed 20 games. Well, Steph's missed 20. I could say that about Steph. But still, it's Steph Curry. Shooting you, you 49, can Clay 22, 26, 26, Steph if you want to go games. Fine, if you want to go Paul Clay Chris giving two, you 19 fine. points. He's giving you 19 points, 8 assists a game, and shooting well from three, and no. gives you great Clay defense. Clay is giving you 19 and 43% from three. Fine, if you want to go hard. Well, what else Clay, is Clay giving Curry, you? Curry, CP3. Is Chris he giving Paul, me any assists? Is he giving me tricks to the foul line? That's is he getting the opponent in foul trouble? It's a totally trouble. different system. I mean, if you're just Judge. looking at the stats, you're going to lose this. Right? Man, that's crazy. Clay Thompson touches the ball like 15 they, they're times They're probably going to give it to you just no, so you can win one. No, they're not, because this is it's your show. It's been like eight weeks since you won I know you, you commenters are coming to back me up. Go ahead. All right. D'Antoni's systems proved to be great in the regular season, not so great in the playoffs. McIntyre's a three-point league. McIntyre gets the Oh, yeah, I'm back, baby. I'm, I'm so back. Glad. Raise a dab on him. Boom. Yeah, Broussard. I am so glad for you because I right. was wondering if you were going to stop coming on the show <laughs> since you keep losing. Uh, yeah, Rich Paul blowing I'm up my phone I'm glad you here. got one. All right, let's go to the final topic. Fired up here. going to lose uh, this one easy. Okay, we know the Cavs are the best team in the East. That's obvious. Uh, that leaves a few teams. Uh, Philly, you love Joel Embiid, president of the Joel Embiid fan club. Uh, we got Milwaukee kind of sputtering. But I, I think it boils down to two teams in the East after Cleveland, Boston and Toronto. And if you told, ask me the question, who's the second best team in the East? I know the stats. I know the standings are going to say Toronto. I'm going to go Boston, and here's why. In a hypothetical Boston versus Toronto matchup, who's got the better coach? Brad Stevens, no doubt. Wait, Casey's uh, having uh, a great that's, year. That's close, nope. though. It, it, Brad this Stevens, year, no doubt. I would probably go with Stevens, but Brad, yep. Dwayne Casey's having a phenomenal Who's year. the best? That's not a big advantage. Uh, who is the best player on the court, Raptors versus Celtics? Kyrie Irving, there's no doubt about it. DeMar DeRozan has been incredible. It's Kyrie. Who's the better defensive team? Defensive efficiency, Boston, first in the NBA. Toronto, fifth. They've split the season series. I go coach, player, defense, all to the Celtics. I know you got the bench in Toronto. 
I'm going Boston. That's second not how best basketball's team in played. How's basketball played? Just because I got Tell the me. best player doesn't mean I'm winning. Oh. <laughs> in the NBA star driven league. LeBron's won three titles. In the how NBA many years has he been the best driven league? league? How many years has no, LeBron no. been the best player you in the league? You have to have a superstar. How many years has LeBron been the best player in the league? I would say 14 until this and year. And he's got Kevin three Durant's titles. Yeah, it so don't tell me just because you got the Chris. best player on the court, you In a series, who's winning? I'm just saying, that was your argument. He's won three rings in 14 years no, of being the best player. He's super team. So I'm just it's saying, LeBron don't tell against, me. against like the Celtics okay. super team. Who's just the, don't that j- your argument that I got the best player, therefore I'm going to win, is is not true. Uh, no, no. I, in this argument, who's a better team, Boston or Toronto? Who scares me more? Who's the second okay, best? How many stars? I, I'm afraid of Kyrie Irving. How many in the playoffs. stars? Are you afraid of DeMar DeRozan? How many DeRozan? legitimate? Are you, have, are you quaking in your boots over how many, Ky, Kyle Lowry? How Who's many, a nice player? Let me talk. How many legitimate stars do you have on Boston City? One. Okay, how many do I have on Toronto? One. I got two. Who? Kyle Lowry is like a five-time All-Star. So I got Kyle I Lowry. I like Kyle Lowry and, a lot. I don't think he's a legitimate star. I got star. Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan. He is a legitimate star. He's not a high-tier star, but he's a legitimate star because he brings it on the defense. Okay, oh, wait, wait, okay, fine. Do you he want me to toss in uh, he is Al tough. Horford? No, you better Your best not. buddy? Should now I listen, bring up Al listen. Horford? So I he's got a five-time two, all-star. I got two stars if you got two, versus I got two. your one. No, 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 no. Wait, time out, time out. If Kyle I got Lowry's two stars star, versus Al Horford. Kyle star. Lowry's better than Al Horford. All right. At what? Checkers? Not, not in basketball. Defense, I don't know that that's a lot. Three-point shooting. All right, look. You mentioned that Boston is the best defensive team in the league. Number one. That's, that's what the numbers bear out. Yeah, but they're out. number 17 in offense. I thought yes. it was, Didn't you just say it was a three-point shooting league? Yep, it is. It's a scoring league. It now, Boston does league. hit threes, but Toronto hits a little bit more. They both hit about the same. Right. Okay, so they're both shooting it well from three. But Toronto is great other places offensively. They can score inside. They can score in the mid-range. They are the only team in the NBA that is top five in both offense and and defense. Your team is freaking 17th yeah. in By offense. By the way, who's they scoring can, inside for finish. Toronto? I'll let you finish. Pascal let me finish. Pascal Siakam. Let me finish. Oh, come on, get out of here. Siakam, and he dunked <laughs> on LeBron James last yeah, week. Any, so, oh, come on. You yo, can dunk no, on LeBron no, in one he, game, I five That's all I'm saying. All right, now look. Beyond that, Toronto has, so I, they got two stars to your one. Or two. even throwing Horford. Okay. Let's go two for two. Two, two for two. Even. My team is more balanced. Toronto is a more balanced yes, team. That's, that's not even up for debate. Toronto has more depth. Mm-hmm. They're, they give you 41 points a game from their bench. Now, that's fourth in the league. Now, typically, typically the leading bench scoring teams are bad teams because they got no stars. Their starters aren't that good, so their bench scores a lot. Yep. But they are unique in Toronto in that they've got two all-stars in the starting lineup, and Jonas Valanciunas, who's a pretty good starter. They got a good starting lineup. Is Jonas Valanciunas better than Jason Tatum? They have a good, let me finish. They have a good starting lineup, and then their bench bench. still gives you 40 points a game. the problem with the bench? There there ain't no problem with the bench. Yes, there is. There's no problem with having a good bench. in the NBA playoffs, you know this. You've covered the league for 20 years. In the playoffs... The bench minutes are short. Yeah, you got to play your nine. Because rotation. why? Because you've got to play your stars no, more but minutes. That's fine. We saw it in the finals. But my point is, could not leave the court for five minutes because the Warriors would just pull away. Okay. But Kyrie no Irving is be ridiculous. Because no, you're you not, are saying benches don't matter. Is that what you They you're matter saying? in the regular season. They Tons. matter in the playoffs. Not as How much. How did Golden State win his first ring? The bench. It was all about no, numbers. No, it was the Hampton numbers. Five. What Who was it about? Andre Iguodala. He came off the bench. Yes, he was in the final he was end of the game lineup. Player. The end of the game lineup matters more My than the bench. My point is, don't tell. Nobody's bringing up the big minutes from Ian Clark three years ago on the Warriors bench. People Stop. are bringing up Sean nobody's, Livingston, I, Andre Iguodala. I, you need a oh, bitch. Yeah, DeLon Wright. He's going to light it you up in the playoffs. You need a bitch. Right? Come on, man. I, it's look, all going to be about Kyrie Irving. I'll the bench will shrink. Yes, it is of going course, to. But he goes from 10 to 8 or 9. So that's not gonna the bench. If you're gonna sit here and tell me bench is not important, then then no, you don't bench even need matters, to be talking but basketball. you're gonna be shrinking those minutes. Kyrie's coming of off the court barely. Fred Van Fleet is playing great. I basketball. love him. I'm a Jacob big fan. Jacob Podol, it's Pascal Siakam. These dudes are balling. OG on a newbie. And the one thing I they like didn't, him, but I mean, are we thing, seeing him in a the crucial one thing they didn't end have crucial last moments year. against Boston? The one it ain't about just the crucial moments, man. It's about 48 minutes. And their bench is going to be better than yours. So you, you're going to be better offensively than you. They got more guys that can score than you. 
The coaching is very close. Hey, by the, the way, Wayne Casey came up with the defense is good. that stifled LeBron James in Dallas when Dallas beat Miami. He was the assistant. You didn't even that know that. That got into he it. Was that was all LeBron's head, super team, no, but it was also, series, JJ But it was Brown. also You're a great defense. You're going to give Dwayne defense. Casey all yes, that? Yes, I'm going to give. Oh no, not all of it. Oh, my gosh. Because uh, LeBron did definitely not he play shrunk. a game. That was a bad play. But Dwayne Casey did a great job defensively. There's no okay. ifs, ands, or okay, buts about out, it. Okay, let's go back. Let's take out the two stars at the top. You can't take out, take out the two take stars. Take out Kyrie and Horford, DeMar, and uh, Lowry. Who's the next best player? Jason Tatum. Who would you rather have after that? Jason Jaylen Tatum is Brown. 19 years old. Jason Tatum is a potential superstar. Potential. In this not right watching, now. He's are not. you watching what Jason Tatum is? Is he a superstar right now? Are you now? seeing the accolades he's getting? Jason Tatum's on the cusp of stardom. On the cusp. When's the cusp going to be? That two, could be this two, postseason. Three years from no, now? no, 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 no. It could way. be this postseason. No way. I could see him going for no 30 way. in a big spot. Toronto is legit. Legit. They are legit. I'm not dismissing them. They're but Boston's Boston. better. Boston. And look, let it be known, this dude's a Boston fan. <laughs> all right. Uh, first off, the be, Horford. Be unbiased. The Horford debate, five All-Stars to four for Lowry, and he's shooting better from three this year Ooh, from Lowry. There's no Chris, way he's better Chris. than Kyle Lowry. <laughs> but I love, he's good, though. I like Horford. I loved the uh, KC 2011 point. That's a good I want to give it a McIntyre. We're going for oh, hard, Oh, my though. goodness. That is that's unbelievable. It's close. Jeez, I feel like LeBron. I mean, come on. Uh, no support here. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Good try. Good try. Signing off for Knockdown Jay with another ring. Oh, shit. <laughs> Chris Broussard. We are here in the zone every week. Go to Apple Podcasts. Go to SoundCloud. Download us. Leave us a, a comment and, of course, five stars. For Jason McIntyre, I'm Chris Broussard. Peace. Let's get it started. You're 34 years old, obviously general manager of the Bucks. You're the youngest, I believe, youngest in the league. Um, is that correct? Do you know? I don't know, actually. I don't know. I, it's gotta be, if not the youngest, it's got to be close. But, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, one of them for sure. How does that feel? Yeah. Um, and how does, does that ever come into play or anything like that? You know, I think it's it's obviously been written and talked about um, a little bit more uh, when when I was originally hired. But I I think irrelevant, you know, independent of what my age is, um, just having an opportunity to be a general manager in professional sports is an unbelievable opportunity and blessing. And so um, that part, I feel very very blessed and thankful for the opportunity, and I, I feel uh, humbled by it. I also, you know, I'm very I know I'm prepared. I'm ready for this. I've spent, you know. 34 years old, but have been in the league for 13 years. And this is all I've ever done is work in the NBA and work in the front office. And I've, I've had an opportunity to work for some great people, great mentors, and John Hammond and Jeff Waltman and Joe Dumars and, and, and others. And I just feel um, really thankful and blessed for the opportunity and, and, you know, look forward to continuing on and in the role and, and getting better every day. You mentioned, you know, Dumars and, and John Hammond and starting with them in Detroit. I know you started as an unpaid intern uh, for the Detroit Pistons. Kind of take me through your rise from that position, obviously all the way up to uh, to a GM. I think so. Um, you know, started as an intern, uh, unpaid intern, my uh, beginning of my senior year in college, and uh, was an office intern, and, and was really thankful to have that opportunity and, and go in there and just you know work in the front office and, and just doing administrative type stuff for, for Joe and John and, and the scouting staff there. And, uh, Flip Saunders, the coach at the time. And, and, you know, I think the rise I would say is, is working really hard and, and being prepared and when opportunities present themselves, being prepared, prepared to take advantage of them. But uh, the opportunity, I think, you know, really I'm just so thankful for and blessed to have is to, to be part of an organization that Joe ran that had a high level of success. I mean, that those Pistons teams, uh, in the period of time I was there, um, in a little part the thing that I was doing had tremendous success. You know, some of the best success in the 2000s so far, you talk about six straight Eastern conference finals, uh, six yep. straight 55 plus win seasons and, uh, two NBA finals and NBA championship. And so, you know, I think it, it might sound very simple, but the rise and, and maybe, you know, some people would say like a really quick rise to where I'm at is, is, starting off being part of an organization with that level of success and learning from those guys and seeing what they've done. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful, you know, to talk to Chauncey and Tayshawn and, and Rip and those guys. And, you know, those guys are a big part of why I am where I am today. Um, you know, being part of an organization that they 
you know, had blood, sweat, and tears to and had a lot of success and let me be part of that as an early person, uh, an early professional. And um, here I am today. Now, I, I read that when you were working as an unpaid intern, obviously to make money, I mean, you worked at Federal Express, Bed Bath & Beyond. I read you even shoveled snow to make money. Um, was there, would there have been a point or did you have in your mind, look, if I don't start making money in basketball at a certain point, I'm going to have to, you know, go get another job or full time or, you know what I mean? Was there any of that or were you just all in like, look, I'm going to do this basketball thing until, uh, until it starts paying off? Well, I think, you know, it's at that time in my life and, and everything is relative to where you're at in your own life. And at that time, I mean, the struggle was real. Uh, I didn't have any money. I was working multiple odd end jobs and doing things just to kind of survive. And, and I, but I had a college degree, right? I, mean, I had a degree, I had a degree from a good educational institution. Um, I had a great internship. So I had a, had a resume, I had an opportunity to, to use that resume and go get a job that would pay me um, out of college. And I also had an opportunity to be working in professional sports and that wasn't paying me. Um, but that was my passion. That was my goal is, is to be involved in basketball. It was really the, the general goal was to be involved in basketball and get paid for it at some level in some way. So it wasn't ever, hey, I want to be an executive in the NBA at that time. I just want to be able to work in basketball, the game that I'm so passionate about, I love so much, and get paid to do it. And this seemed like the best opportunity I had. But the struggle was real. you know. And at one point, actually, when I was working for FedEx, because I had a degree and I was working the night shift um, in a pretty quick period of time, you know, they approached me and offered me an opportunity to manage the night shift um, and, and pay me like a real salary and benefits and a good company. Right? Yeah. And, um, that was, that was probably the closest I came to saying, you know what, like maybe I need to kind of cut, cut away from the dream. It's been two years. I'm not really getting paid anything. <laughs> you know, this is no, no one really succeeds. And, you know, this is such a long shot. Um, yeah. and here I've got an opportunity to kind of go this path, but if I would have done that, obviously it would have been a full-time commitment and I would have had to, uh, part ways of my internship with the Pistons at the time. Um, but decided ultimately to kind of turn them down and just keep working the, uh, the part-time shift that was working and keep doing the intern opportunity to the Pistons, and, and it's all worked out. So Now, did you go to the Pistons and be like, look, I got this offer. I want to stay with you guys, but obviously I need to start making some money, or did it just kind of come uh, naturally that they just decided to, you know, promote you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and this is – uh, you know, maybe just, just, I think again, like I truly believe I'm blessed and, and, and just have had unbelievable uh, people to work for and set of circumstances and opportunities in my life and have been in a position to take advantage of them. Um, so far I've never, I've never asked for, uh, uh, a raise. I've never asked for, uh, a promotion in my career so far. So I've never, wow. you know, my time in Detroit, I never went to Joe or John and said, Hey, I need to get paid or I need to do this or let's talk about a title. Uh, I never asked to go to Milwaukee when John, John approached me. I've never asked. I've never asked for anything. Um, just keep working hard and, and try to do the best I can and treat people the right way. And, and so far, that's, uh, that's you know, lend well for me. That's worked out. Well, now, look, as you know, I know you grew up a basketball junkie in Sandusky, Michigan, a small town. I wanted to play in the NBA. Um, and there are a lot of guys out there like you who – can't play in the NBA or even maybe even at the college or high school level, but they want to work in basketball and they want to run a team like you do or coach a team. What advice would you give guys like that? You know, as you know, Chris, because I, I mean, we do different things, but I feel like our story is parallel. You know, I, I imagine you grew up a basketball junkie. You, you played yeah. basketball at the highest level you could, the most competitive way that you could and try to find a way to be involved in the sport. And, and you've done that at the highest level in your business and you've had a lot of success. And, and so far, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing. And, and I think I'm sure you get asked the same question by a lot of young people that want to try to figure out a way to have a path and have success that you've had. And, you know, for me, what I always tell them is that kind of what I just said to you, my goal was never to become a general manager. My goal was to constantly work hard, treat people the right way and be involved in basketball at some level um, at, as, as best as I possibly could. And, and that's kind of got me to where I am today. Um, what I, the one specific thing I would always tell them is get as many experiences as you can. 
And so I said, if you start, if, if you're hunting to become a general manager, now you're going to narrow your experiences. And I personally don't think that that's going to lend well for you. I think that what you need to do is broaden your experiences, be involved in sport, basketball, as much as you possibly can, take opportunities, take chances, try as many things as you can, and your path will kind of find its way. Um, and, and so I've always challenged people to do that. And then and the other piece, you know, just academically, I always tell them I truly believe um, in any level, in any business, business probably, but I think in professional sports, the piece that people miss is you have to be able to write really well and you have to be able to communicate really well. And it's so, you know, so often as I always say to people like, well, show me some written work that you've done, you know, show me a project you've done, mm. show me an analysis you've done. Um, you know, those are the types of things that we look for in the bucks anyways, the people that we want to add to our organization, people that can really present and write. Do, do you still the play? Best. Yeah, we try to play. I, you know, a bunch of young guys on my staff, we'll, we got a little bit of downtime or if it's late at night or whatever, we'll try to get out there and play for an hour just as a way to exercise and kind of get a little stress relief. So, so we, we play, you know, hopefully at least once or twice a week if I'm in town. That's pretty good. When you're, you should, you guys should play, uh, you're in Oakland, you should play Bob Myers and his crew. Cause I know they play so too. <laughs> they do in, in summer league actually got together with Bob Myers and his crew a little bit. We played in summer league. So we'll, we'll, we'll really? do that again this year. You know, yeah, Bob and I have done that. It's been great. Now, did you guys play like bucks against warriors? No. Or did you mix it up? <laughs> <laughs> no, mix it up. I, I don't know if that says it. That's the honestly, funny little story. Like last year we were playing Toronto in the uh, playoffs. Right. And yep. uh, got some of the guys together in Milwaukee before must've been game four, I guess. Um, in Milwaukee, um, and we're like, hey, let's you know, let's get together. We'll play some hoops. So we played at like six o'clock in the morning, and we we contemplated the idea of Bucks Raptors, but we, there's no way that that would be a good <laughs> idea during a playoff series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what, it'd be exciting. At least for the media guys, it'd be fun to watch the staff go at yeah. it. You know, <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to think off my head. Sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> No, nah, that'd be fun. So what's your average day like as an NBA GM? <laughs> um, I, you know, I think there's there's different periods. Uh, there's different seasons within a season. Um, I think, you know, if I were to break it down, you have your off season, which is draft and free agency, and, and I would say training camp. Um, you have your in season, uh, obviously, which is, you know, when you're playing. And then within, within the in season of your regular season playoffs, you have your trade deadline. So for us, you have the games in the season, you have your trade deadline, you have your draft and your free agency. And those all have uh, paces to them and different different uh, speeds and different schedules. And so I think um, what I would say on average is, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, phone calls, there's a lot of communication, communication with ownership, with agents, with players, um, you know, being a general manager and, and and heading up, you know, multiple departments in the side of basketball. Uh, there's lots of communication with security staff, and medical staff, and scouting staff, coaching staff. Um, you know, we, we try to meet. We try to be really diligent about meeting and having department head meetings and things like that. So I just think, you know, an average day is just really full of a lot of communication, negotiating, you know, troubleshooting. Um, and then, you know, the part I'm trying to learn and, and get better at every day is because I have great people who work with me is delegating, you know, delegating stuff to build new, my assistant GM or, Ryan Hoover, who runs our scouting, or Dave Dean, who runs uh, basketball operation, delegating to those guys so that they can manage their departments, and, and that frees me up to continue to uh, do the thing that ultimately I'm responsible for, which is evaluating talent and acquiring talent on our team. Well, look, you, you, you're in a great situation. Um, and one, one reason is because, obviously, you have Giannis Adetokounmpo. Um, and Kevin Durant, he said Giannis could become the greatest player ever. Uh, what do you feel is the ceiling for Giannis? Um, you know, being around Giannis uh, now, you know, since, since we've drafted him, and, and what an honor that it is to, to be able to be part of his growth and development and just witness it firsthand up close and personal. Um, one thing I would say, and I'm not trying to be funny when I just say this, but one, one of the things I've learned is, is to not ever put a ceiling on Giannis. Um, <laughs> I, I think he, he is... Um, he is unique enough as a player, unique enough as a person. I think you see the 60 minutes uh, yeah. special that was done on him, and you really get to see the human side of Giannis, which a lot of people don't get to see, and I'm glad they can now. But, you know, his sense of humor, um, how humble he is, how gracious he is, uh, how confident, quietly confident he is. Um, 
he is he is just so unique in every way that I truly don't think there is a ceiling for Giannis. And, and I don't know if that manifests itself in, in becoming the greatest player of all time or not. I just know that um, it's not fair to, to put a ceiling on him right now with his age and his development curve and the things that he's done in a short period of time in this league. Um, I, just, I think that the, um, the future is kind of unlimited for Giannis. What now? Obviously, he's at this point. He's not a three-point shooter. How important in this day and age do you think it is that he has to develop that shot? I mean, obviously, he's great, greatly successful without it. But in this type of league nowadays, is it how important is it that he develops that part of his game? Well, I think it's important. There's no doubt. I, any any time you can add something to your game, and, and one of the things that Giannis is is proven early on is I think he comes back every year with something different. He's, he's been able to add, and I think great players do that. I think great players figure out a way year in and year out to continue to add something to the game and, and continue to evolve and develop. And Giannis has done that. I mean, he's he's now added a really, I think, really effective um, uh, mid-range game. You know, he's, he's added a post game. Uh, he's become even more uh, reliable, inefficient as a ball handler and playmaker. So, He's added every year, and I think he'll continue to add to his to his range and shooting the ball. And I think that is important. It's important to his development. It's important to our team's development. I don't think, however, that it's necessary uh, for us to get where we want to get. I think, and I, I might be wrong about this, but my opinion is, if you actually study that the great players that have won championships in our league, um, they kind of define the style of play that that, that is successful in the league uh, at that time. So I think if you look at you know Miami Heat teams and the way that they played. They are very much defined by the pace and space and the uh, kind of the drive and kick game that LeBron initiated. You know, just his ability to put pressure on the defense and move the ball for his teammates, surrounded by a lot of shooters. Uh, that's how they were successful. You look at Golden State Warriors and the way they've been successful. They've been very successful with, with shooting the ball. You know, and Steph, Steph has really been the catalyst for that in his ability to shoot the deep ball. I think if we... You know, hopefully our goal is to develop into a team that, that consistently contends for uh, championships, and Giannis will obviously be um, the, the key cog in that. I think he's going to define the style of play that hopefully is a championship-style play for the Milwaukee Bucks, and that that could uh, include him shooting the ball from three really accurately, and it might not. You know, um, I think it helps us if he does, but I, I don't think it's it's a necessity necessarily. That's a great point you made about, you know, because you, I hadn't, to be honest, I had not really thought about it the way you just said it, but you're absolutely right. You know, you see a lot of teams copied the Miami Heat, you know, style, and now obviously people are copying Golden State. What do you feel like, and obviously this is you, you talking with the coaching staff as well, you know, what do you think the ideal style uh, would would be for the team to play right now as it's currently constituted, the Bucks. Yeah, I, I think, um, and, and Coach Pointy would would agree with this. We talk about it all the time. Um, right now, the Milwaukee Bucks are best uh, when we're really aggressive defensively. Um, you know, just really kind of taking up space, using our length and athleticism. And, and when we get a team to, we force a miss, we get out in transition and we run. You, know, you got guys. You know, whether Giannis has the ball or he's on the wing, you got Eric Bledsoe, who's, you know, if not the fastest player in the league, one of the fastest, uh, pushing the ball up the front. You've got Giannis and Jabari running the wings, uh, Tony and Chris running the wings, you know, either shooting or finishing. I mean, we really just kind of an aggressive, athletic, long team that can get out and go and transition. That's when we're at our best. Um, I think for us to get to where we want to get, we have to be able to find ways to do that more often. Uh, but also then you, you know, as, as you know, games are not always played in transition. They're not always played at a, at a fast pace. And so you have to be able to, to be a good half-court offense as well and a half-court defense as well. So um, we've got a ways to go and a ways to develop. But I, I do think that we have the potential to be a team that just uses our length and athleticism as we grow and get older and mature and the body's mature. That athleticism and length will also add a lot of strength. And I think that we can be, you know, kind of a nightmare matchup for people because we can play – three to five positionalist players at any time that uh, really can kind of switch everything and do multiple things with the ball in your hands, multiple things off the catch, just be a really dynamic, versatile team. And that's, you know, I think that's what we're trying to build here in Milwaukee. I mean, obviously you're always looking to improve the roster, but do you feel like you have the core of a championship contender right now that, you know, as, as the team grows and matures, 
you have that in place and then it's just adding around that? Or do you feel like you need some more big moves to get kind of where you want to go? I think we're really, we are really happy with the core group guys that we have. Um, you know, you look at Giannis and Eric and Chris and Tony and Malcolm and, and John and Jabari, um, you know, and they got young guys, Hassan and um, DJ and Sterling, and, and, you know, it, we have a core group of guys that, that I think can take us to where we want to get. Um, but we don't know that yet. I mean, we're early, we're early in the evolution development of this team. Yeah. And what we, I think what we want to do is we want to constantly continue to look to improve and get better. And so um, we like this group that we have a lot. We think this group is good enough and that we continue to grow and get to the place that we want to get. At the same time, we're constantly going to do our work and look for opportunities to improve and, and be better and constantly evaluate where we're at. Um, on every facet, you know, the roster is only one of the facets that I think is, is necessary to have a championship level organization. So, I mean, that's, that's from a staffing standpoint, from um, infrastructure standpoint, from a roster standpoint, you know, all those things are things that we constantly look at and continue to try to improve on and get better. But uh, we're very happy with the group of guys that we have and, and think this group has a chance to do some special things now and going forward. I know you called into a radio station uh, recently to deny reports that Jabari Parker uh, had been close to getting traded. Why do you think those reports about Jabari have surfaced about him? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I, and, and I wouldn't usually do something like that. It's just it's been, <laughs> you know, there's there's been a number of reports, it, it seems like, maybe throughout the entire year. It started early on with the Eric stuff. Um when we were talking about trading for Eric Bledsoe, it, Jabari was no, never a part of any of those conversations. Um, and it's kind of just went on throughout the year at different times. It'll surface, you know, Buck's going to trade Parker, Parker's not coming back, all these different things. And finally, you know, and, I, and of course, you know, I've talked to Jabari and his agent, and we have great relationship and great open communication. And, and, and they know, like, if anything were ever imminent, just like any of our players, like we'll, we're going to handle our business the right way. I learned that from, from John Hammond and Joe Dumars in a strong way to always err on the side of the player, and communicate well with the agent and the player, and, and be fair to those guys and never let them read about something in the media and uh, something that's real, that is. And so yeah. you know, Mark and, and Jabari know that you know none of that stuff is true, but at, at some point I'm like, you know, at some point we got to go out and actually say, like, this is just BS and, and had enough. And, and I think the reason it continues to come up I truly believe this, Chris, is you have a guy that's had multiple injuries. And so the unfortunate truth is Jabari has spent a lot of time rehabbing over the last couple of years and hasn't, you know, been a part of playing for our team as much as some of the other guys. And had he been playing for our team all these last couple of years more, people wouldn't be talking about trading him. People would be talking about how good we are and how good he is. And, and the more that you see him come back and be healthy and play the way he's been playing recently, and, and we're really proud where he's at today, I think that that'll become less and less of a story. And I, the other part of it, I think that's natural is we didn't extend him, you know? So we tried, we had conversations, we tried to extend Jabari. We went through the process like every team does with, with pending uh, restrictive free agents going into their, into their last season. And the truth is that it's really hard to get extensions done. I mean, there's, there's maybe if you look throughout history in the last probably 10 years of rookie first classes, uh, first round pick classes, I would say, five or six guys a year get an extension out of let's say 20 to 25 guys that are eligible because not every guy gets their options picked up. But um, I mean, that's a low percentage of guys that actually get rookie extensions. And so I think other, the other thing people saw is that we didn't extend them. And so the natural thing is to say that we're trying to trade him. And that's just not true. Um, we're really happy with Jabari. We're happy with where he's at. And we look forward to him continue to grow the organization. Do you see, I mean, we all know what he was at Duke and, and all the uh, expectations on him healthy, do you see him still being able to be that type of player um, who, who really could, I mean, if he can, he could be that <laughs> that star right next to Giannis. I mean, does he have that potential, or is he more of just a really good pro but may, may never be what, you know, people thought he was coming out of Duke? No, I think there's no doubt in my mind he has that potential. Um, I, I, <clears throat> if you really just kind of look at some of the stuff he's done here since he's came back, um, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, his, his body, the conditioning that he's in, his athleticism, his speed, his, 
his pop, everything that he had prior to these injuries is, is there. And some people would even tell you that it's even better than it was before uh, because he's redone his body. Um, and he has such a natural gift of scoring. He has a natural gift uh, to be able to make plays for others. Uh, he's an unbelievable person. And I mean, he's, he's a young player that, that's in, in his four years in the NBA is, is probably missed the equivalent of close to two full seasons. Um, so he's missing development time, but he's still really young and he's still in a great spot and he's going to continue to get better. He's going to continue to work hard. And, and the, the thing I'm most excited for Jabari is just for him to really have the opportunity to continue to focus on basketball and, and, and getting better as a basketball player and better as a person, continue to improve every day. And I, I think, you know, as he gets more time to do that, I really think the sky's the limit for him as well. I'm sure, uh, John, one of the toughest decisions you've had to make so far was, was getting rid of Jason Kidd as a head coach. Take me in, inside that decision process. Yeah, a really tough decision. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with, with Jason um, his entire time in Milwaukee. Obviously, he was there when, when, when he was hired. Um, and, you know, he, we're really thankful for the things that he was able to do. He was, he was an important piece. He was an important piece of um, – you know, Giannis's development, important piece of, of, you know, helping Fon develop and a lot of our young guys, um, you know, some of the stuff that Chris has done. And so Jason and his staff, you know, done a really great job, led us to the playoffs uh, multiple seasons. Um, and so those decisions are tough. And that's the first time that I've been part of, of making a decision uh, of that magnitude on a coach um, in that role, obviously, in my first year as a GM. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, have publicly stated goals and internal goals of, of building a team that we think can uh, uh, consistently compete for championships over a long period of time. And, you know, there's certain things in, in, in performance wise of going on with a team and that we evaluated and discussed and, and went through the process and just felt like at that time, it was, it was the best thing for, for the franchise now and going forward to, uh, to get in a different voice and, and bring someone else in. But, um, you know, as we said, and truly mean that, you know, I, I'm very thankful for the, personally the things that Jason, you know, I learned from Jason and being around him, very thankful for the things that he contributed to the organization. And, and we hope him the best of luck going forward. And, and I, I believe he has a chance to, to um, be a coach again and do a great job again. Now, as you know, there were reports that came out about his relationship with Giannis and how much Giannis liked him and he wanted him as the head coach. What's your view on you know, consulting with players, star players, concerning personnel moves, whether it be a player move or a coaching move. Yeah, I, I think um, for us that you've got you've got players in your organization that that know what's going on, so they know what's going on from a coaching standpoint. They know what's going on on medical staff. They understand you know, dynamics of their team. They, they know other players in the league, whether it's, uh, you know, players on their team or, or opponents. You know, these guys are great resources. And what we've constantly, you know, talked to these guys about is, and Giannis in particular, and Chris and, and Eric, I've had these conversations with these guys and Jabari at times. Never, I don't think it's fair to ever put you in a position where you're making decisions, right? So we're not going to ever come to you and say, like, what do we do here? What should we do? I mean, that's, that's not the role that they want to be in. It's not the role that we want them in. Um, but I do think it would be senseless for us not to get their opinions and get their input on decisions and not every decision. I mean, certain decisions are bigger than others, certain decisions, um, certain guys have more of a, a voice and, and, uh, and an input, uh, input into it. And I think, you know, using Giannis and using Chris and using Jabari and, and, and Malcolm and these guys using their, their opinions and their knowledge, I think is an important thing for us as we make decisions and evaluate decisions. So I would say I'm sorry, just to kind of condense it down, never put them in a position to make a decision, but I think obviously utilize the resource at different times when you feel like it's appropriate. Now you guys were 23 and 22 under Jason, 16 and 13 since then under Joe Prunty. What do you feel like is a realistic goal for you guys? I mean, obviously you want to win the championship every year, but you know, are you, is there a benchmark where you're going to be saying, man, if we don't get this far, like we should definitely get this far. If we don't, it's been a disappointing season. Yeah. I think a, a really good benchmark for us, um, first off, 
if, if we if we're able to uh, make the playoffs this year, and we hope that we are, and we hope that we finish the season strong here, we're in a great spot right now. Uh, it'll be the first time that that this organization has made the playoffs in back-to-back seasons uh, in like 14 seasons. I think the 0304 season. And so that's a realistic goal for us, and that would be a great accomplishment for the franchise and for this team um, because you know, what we talk about is consistency. And so we want to build consistency from season to season. That's important. Obviously, we want to build on consistency within a season as well. But if we can uh, string together back-to-back playoff appearances, that, that's, that's a really great bar for a young team. And then, you know, last year we felt like we had a real opportunity to win a first-round series against the Toronto Raptors. Um, we felt like we were a half away from having them in a stranglehold, being up 3-1 in that series and, and really having a chance to win it. And I, I think it's a realistic goal and, and opportunity for us to get into these playoffs and to make some noise and try to win a, a, a first-round series. And if, we, if we're if we able to win a first-round series, that'll be the first time the franchise has won a first-round series uh, in 17 years, I think since the 2001 season. So uh, regular season record matters. You know, the way that you play and the dominance and the consistency is consistency in which you play matters. And those are things that we want to improve on and get better on every year. And I think we've made steps in that this year. But overall season kind of accomplishments, if we're able to get in the playoffs again this year and we're able to uh, really compete in the first round and maybe even win a first round series, I think those are great marks. And, and I'm not trying to put a ceiling on this team. This team has the talent and the opportunity and the potential to do more than that. But if we could do those two things, I think those would be really impressive things for, for the season. I know you said that Joe Prince has a chance to, you know, be the head coach going forward. There was a, re- a report a while ago, like a couple weeks ago, about Jeff Van Gundy, Rick Pitino, David Fizda, that you guys had a list already, and I know there were some strong denials. How, how far along are you in the coaching search, or is it just we're waiting until, you know, we see how this season plays out? Yeah, it's like such a such a uh, uh, sensitive question, and and every you know every kind of comment that's made or or retort that's put out there, I think can be taken you know multiple ways, and, and so it's 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 always like a sensitive thing to comment on. But as I said uh, publicly a few times, Joe and I talk about this all the time. You know, our ownership group talks about this. They've talked to Joe about this, and so I'll try to say it as plainly and clearly as possible. Uh, again. There is not a search right now. When we when we uh, hired Joe to finish the rest of the season as our head coach, not as an interim coach, but as a head coach, our promise to him, and we've upheld that, is that he is the coach for the season. And what comes along with that is we're not going to be out interviewing and going through and trying to find his replacement during the season. That's just that's not how we want to handle business, and that's not what we've done. Um, what we are going to do is we're going to evaluate him and the staff, and we're really happy with what they've done so far. They're doing a great job. Joe, Joe and I have a great relationship. Uh, we have a great relationship with the staff that's in place, and these guys are working working their tails off every day to, to accomplish the goals that we just talked about. And what we are going to do is we're going to give them every opportunity to be part of a search that we are going to have in the offseason. So we are going to go through a search in the season. Um, Joe and this staff have, a, have every opportunity to be part of that and, and to earn the opportunity to go forward with this team uh, but we're not going to go through and create a list and have a t- have priority guys and interview guys and talk to guys at uh, any point during the season. So that, that doesn't mean that we're not going to do our work. Of course, like, we have to get ourselves prepared. We have to put together what our process would look like. We have to, we have to be prepared for that off-season search process. But as part of that, we're not meeting with anyone. We're not formulating any list of priorities and saying, like, these are our targeted guys or anything like that. So um, I, I think – you know, again, to be plain and clear about it, Joe's the coach. There isn't a list in place, but of course, we're getting ready and preparing a process, and so that we're ready for when the off when the season does end, we can start our process. and And I fully believe that Joe and the staff uh, have done a great job so far, and they're going to be a, a key part of that. Now, I saw one of your owners, Wes Edens. He came out and said that he'd be open to hiring a woman as a head coach. What? How soon do you think? whether it's you guys or whoever, do you think we're close to that happening? And what challenges do you think that might present, if any? Um, I hope, I hope we're close to it happening because I think there's some really qualified, um, really qualified candidates that are out there. Um, Obviously, you know, you know, Becky Hammond being like one of the the most uh, uh, publicly kind of uh, renowned ones that has been talked about in the recent, but I, I, 
I think, like, I don't see talent just with that. I, I think that, you know, diversity in the workplace is important, but not diversity for, diver- for diversity's sake. Diversity because there's really qualified people from all different walks of life, races, genders, um, that are really qualified people that can contribute in a high level and in a high way at any position in a professional sports franchise, like they do in any position, any other corporation um, in the world. And so I hope that we're not far away. I don't think that we are. I think that by and large, uh, we're a league that, that supports diversity, that supports um, opportunities for everyone that's qualified and, and, and deserving of those opportunities. And I, and I think you're going to continue to see, you know, our, our ownership, specifically the Milwaukee Bucks, but other ownerships um, from ownership groups from the rest of the teams in the league continue to uh, be aggressive and and be open to doing what's right, which is allowing people that are qualified to uh, to work in these positions, no matter what it is, head coach, general manager, uh, assistant coach, assistant general manager, president of a team, whatever these positions are, there's, there's uh, multiple people that are qualified and, and deserving of these opportunities, and I think that you're going to see them uh, start to take advantage of that. Okay, I, I, I promise I'm, I'm about to wrap up. I know you've been very patient with your time. I um, wanted, to ask, <laughs> wanted to ask you, you know, with Giannis, obviously with the 60 Minutes episode, his fame is just transcending basketball at this point. And we've seen some of the great players in the league leave small markets for more glamorous cities like LeBron, Carmelo, Anthony, Shaq from Orlando to L.A., it even happened with the Bucks, you know, back in the 70s, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, wanting out and, and going to the Lakers in a trade. Um, how do you – how big of a concern is it in Milwaukee that, you know, that could happen with Giannis? I mean, he seems like the type of guy that doesn't think that way, but, you know, how big of a concern is that for you guys? I think it's, it's something that uh, with any prominent player – uh, is going to be talked about, and it, as you get closer to any type of contract uh, date or deadline, whether that be an extension deadline or a free agency, upcoming free agency, or anything like that, those things always gain traction as the snowball effect, and they just kind of just you know, really grow and grow and grow. So it's always going to be a conversation, whether or not it's a concern. You know, I I wouldn't say it's a concern, and, and here's why: there's there's examples of guys leaving guys leaving free agency. That's their choice. Um, there are mechanisms in place in our league that really benefit the team. Whether or not the situation is good, their success, the organization is strong, functional, dysfunctional, whatever, there are financial uh, 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 things in place that, that benefit the team for keeping their players. On top of that, that's just at a pure, pure base level. Um, on top of that, I know how great our organization is and it will continue to become and grow. Um, I know how much Giannis loves our city and loves our organization. And Giannis is an extremely loyal person that that has publicly stated one time that this is where he wants to play, this is where he wants to be, and that he wants to win championships in Milwaukee. And our goal is to win championships with him in Milwaukee. Um, and there's also, you know, lots of examples of guys that have chosen to stay with their teams. And, and most of those examples, I think, are, are organizations that are strong, that are well-run, that have high levels of success. And I think your most recent examples um, – are, are San Antonio, obviously, with the number of guys that they've had, and Tim Duncan and Manu and Tony and, and um, David Robinson. I think Oklahoma City and what you saw with Russell Westbrook is a great example. You know, if you go back and look at um, the Detroit Pistons or the Chicago Bulls, I mean, I think, you know, again, I think it comes down to who the player is and who the person is and what do they want out of it. And then it comes down to how well the organization is run and how much success they have. And that's, that's, that's my job. That's my job to put this organization – um, from a basketball standpoint, in a position to have uh, the ultimate level of success with Giannis as part of it, and to run it in such a way that, that uh, in a family way, the way that I learned under Joe Dumars and John Hammond, to run an organization that feels like a family, that's loyal, that's open, that's trusting, um, and that has a high level of success. And I think if you do those things, uh, you put yourself in a great position to keep transcendent stars like Giannis Antetokounmpo is becoming. John, last question. Um, he's kind of, I don't know if I should say mystery player, but fine maker. You know, you guys drafted him, and he's had some really nice moments. Um, what, I don't want you to, you said you don't put a ceiling on players, but what's his potential? Well, you know, Fawn, Fawn is, um, I think it's an interesting story because he came in, you know, to start last year, 
And we drafted him early, and, and people were kind of uh, surprised where we drafted him. But, you know, the things that we saw in Son, that the reason, some of the reasons that we drafted beyond his physical attributes really just comes down to his character, his work ethic. Um, I mean, he is he works as hard as anyone. He's an unbelievable person. He's really intelligent. And by the way, he's seven foot one. He's athletic, and he's mm-hmm. got a seven three, seven four wingspan. And so, you take this this young guy who people would say was a project, and we kind of draft him as a development guy, and doesn't play much early in the season last year, and and really doesn't really start getting time until you know fifty games or so into the season, and in a short period of time becomes our starter and and has an unbelievable run in the playoffs as our starter, um, in, in a playoff series in his rookie year. And so I think when you do something like that, people put expectations on you of what they expect you to do in your second season. And, you know, Thon's gotten better. He's, he's improving, but he hasn't probably taken the jump that people expected when they think, like, well, here's the guy that started six playoff games for the Milwaukee Bucks last year as a 19-year-old rookie. And um, so now he's a 20-year-old player, and he's still seven foot one. He still has a 7'3 wingspan. He's still an unbelievable worker. He's still really intelligent. And, you know, our only expectations for Thon are to continue to work hard, continue to treat this thing the right way, be patient, and just, just invest in his development. And he's done that. And I think as long as he continues to do that, I think he's going he's gonna to have a really successful career in the NBA, and, and we're going to be really fortunate to have him. Well, John, man, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time, man. You've been great. And uh, good luck this season. I, I would like – I say this honestly. I would really like to see you guys do some damage in the playoffs. I think that'd be very exciting. Chris, I really appreciate the time. And, and you know, we'd love to have you come to Milwaukee for, for a playoff game. That would be unbelievable. And, and, and if you're going to put together the uh, Milwaukee basketball tournament, we ought to make you the commissioner of it. <laughs> hey, I'm with that. I'm with that. As long as I don't have to <laughs> get out there and play. <laughs> appreciate All the right, time. All right, man. Well, yeah, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Talk to you later. All right, bye.